thank you. Dear sir, dear madam, welcome to our department of neurosurgery. I'm your physician, and as you know, you've been referred to our department for a clinical condition which may be an indication for brain surgery. Now, if this was really the case, what would you expect from me as your physician? You may think of surgical skills and you may think of empathy, but generally speaking, I think what you expect is to get the best available treatment, regardless of the cost. Um, <laughs> now, how do we define best in medicine? In 1995, David Sackett introduced a concept called evidence-based medicine, and basically it consists of three pillars. One, scientific literature. Two, physician experience. And three, maybe surprisingly, patient preference. Now, in my talk, I will focus on the first two parts because the next session will contain more information on patient preference in detail. So, what about the literature? PubMed, which is the most used search engine for professional health literature, um, uh, currently indexes more than 700,000 articles every single year. And the amount, the volume of knowledge is just increasing, not only in medicine in general, but also in medicine. The amount of knowledge, the volume of information, is increasing at a much higher speed than our capacity to deal with it. And this creates a situation which the World Health Organization calls the no-do gap. It is available somewhere in this huge pile of papers, but it doesn't reach your bedside. So, how to change that? Before we start thinking about it and discussing, let's first take a look at some limitations of the scientific literature. First, not all literature is of the same quality. We have differences, we call them evidence levels, and we say class one evidence is the best we have. It's made up of randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis, and then we have class two, which is mainly cohort studies, and class three, which is mainly expert opinion. Now, fortunately, David Sackett explicitly stated in this article on evidence-based medicine that evidence-based medicine is not restricted to class one evidence. Unfortunately, in practice, the opposite seems frequently to be the case, especially among policy makers who think that if it's not randomized, it doesn't count. I think it's wrong. Although you do have the evidence levels, even class two, even class three evidence can contain valuable information, which may be a pity to disregard. But let's go back. Let's go back to class one evidence, the best we have. What we actually do in class one studies, we take this half of the audience, hoping that all the audience people have some similar characteristics, we give you drug one, we take this half, we give you drug two, we compare the results on some specific outcome parameter, and then we say, you do better. But, sir, how would this translate to your situation? If I gave you drug one or drug two, can I predict how you would respond? No, I can't. So, to translate the results, the information from the literature to the individual like you or you, you do need some translational factor. And I think this translational factor is physician experience. In my opinion, physician experience in medical decision making is mainly about probability assessment. Not in a percentage, not in a raw number, not to say this is 95%, but more in degrees of likelihood. And you all have read that large innovative IT companies Dream, dreamed about creating a very large database and putting in all kinds of symptoms and signs and diseases and say, well, you know, you just go to our website in the future, you type in your complaints and boom, you get a diagnosis. <laughs> Thanks for that one. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think it will work that way. I don't believe in decision-making systems at this moment because you will have an endless variety of combinations of symptoms and signs and diseases and we don't have all the probabilities calculated. They're not, not available. And for a variety of reasons, very difficult to get. So forget about decision-making systems. Dream about decision-supporting systems. Because I think this is what we should go for. Now, what would this look like? The 
main limitation of evidence-based practice, of getting the results of all this information to your bedside, is time. There are some others, but time is a very important one. So what we need, we need a system using modern information technology, which is capable of bringing down this huge pile of papers to the information which is relevant for your situation based on your specific individual conditions like gender, like age, weight, prior history, other drugs, specific clinical parameters for this condition, just name it. We can build these systems. We don't have them yet, maybe some experiments. But this is the way I think we should go. Digital guidelines, meaning we put a PDF file online, is not a way to go. It just costs too much time. We need smarter ways to process this huge amount of information. So, what do we need? What do we need to make this happen? To some part, and I, I realize it's not very inspiring, it may be boring, but we do need standardization because we have lots of information. But it should be integrated in some way. We need standardization in the way we get the information. We need standardization how we provide it to a decision supporting system. And I think we need electronic health records, but also they need to be able to speak a common language. If not, we will still remain with this no-do gap. We will remain with a huge bunch of information that doesn't reach the bedside, at least not to the degree which is satisfactory. So, in summary, because the point doesn't have to take that much time, we need to shift. We need to shift from the medical knowledge in papers and large volume in meta-analysis and reviews in Cochrane and up-to-date and just name it, to an interactive system using the knowledge which is available and tailoring it to the individual patient who comes and says, I want the best available treatment. Please give it to me. It's a different discussion than whether it's affordable. But if it's affordable, if we are willing to offer it, we should be able to find it, we should be able to know it. So to narrow this no-do gap, we should develop, invest in development of decision-supporting systems and maybe dream about decision-making systems in the far future. But at this moment, I think disregarding physician experience would be not smart. Disregarding patient preference, neither. Because the combination of this individual tailored piece of information provided to the physician and the patient can be combined with the physician's experience to balance the probabilities and the preference of the patient. And this combination can offer you what I think will be the best available treatment for this individual patient. And this situation, in my opinion, would be the paradigm shift from medical knowledge to practical healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you.